Hi, I'm Michelle Malik and you're watching in this special. Self-medication has perhaps always existed in the world in one, one form or the other. But how has it changed with an influx of medical information and greater access to medication? Let's discuss this further. Joining us for this conversation is Professor Ethel Johnston, who's a doctor of clinical pharmacology at the Queen Mary University of London. He joins us from London. Also joining us today is Dr. Jack Singer, who's a pediatrician joining us from London. Let me begin with Professor Ethel Johnston. Professor uh, Johnston, as I said here, that with the rise of information, with how much access individuals have to different sources, stating medical news, whether it's the internet or, you know, getting WhatsApp messages, there is this trend, rising trend towards self-medication. What do you think individuals need to remember, however, when they move towards it? Well, I'm never too sure in this country, in the United Kingdom, why self-medication is that popular. Um, you get your... your um, medication uh, at very low cost from, from the National Health Service, and there's no real requirement to self-medicate. But that doesn't stop people taking particularly herbal medication, uh, the things like uh, St. John's wort, which is supposed to help with depression, uh, and other uh, herbal medicines that are available uh, in uh, shops on the high street. Those can cause problems with existing medication that you might be taking. So there are issues involved with that. And of course, the other issue, I think, which is a growing problem, is self-medication with um, analgesics, um, pain medicine, um, and people taking uh, too much or too often uh, with uh, analgesics with pain medicine. Right. Now, how much is much here, especially when we talk about over-the-counter pain medication that many individuals feel like has become a part of their daily routines? I think you've said it exactly there. It's become part of our daily routines. Taking pain medication should not be part of a daily routine uh, unless you're under medical supervision. And even then, you need to be careful that you're not taking too much because when you're, you're given these prescriptions, there are, there's a specification to how you should take them. You should just not take them uh, all the time, and you should take as little medication as at all possible. That might seem strange coming from a clinical pharmacologist, but you should not take medication unless you really need it. Right. Dr. Shaq uh, Zinger, now how the conversation changed when we talk about children and their parents um, putting them on medication without consulting a professional? In which cases do you think it is allowed? In which cases is it not allowed? I remember earlier we had a conversation about how the pandemic has made many individuals realize that they can go without uh, constantly seeking medical help. But we don't want to blur the lines here. So give us uh, an insight into that. Uh, I, I think in some respects, the UK is quite uh, in, it is quite uh, different from a lot of other countries in that uh, a lot of uh, prescription drugs in this country, uh, which are which are available only on prescription by a physician, are available in a large number of countries in the world just across the counter. So people can, number one, self-diagnose themselves or their children. Uh, number two, decide which antibiotic they want. And number three, go into a pharmacy and buy it. That's one group, which are the prescription drugs, which are not, which in a large percentage of countries are available without a prescription. Uh, the other group is the homeopathic drugs, and the last are the herbal medicines that you were speaking to earlier. So those are three great categories of drugs. Um, and people can use the internet, and they uh, have, unfortunately, they, they use it in, in, in not a very good way because the internet doesn't have a filter on it. And so everybody uh, can publish what they want about anything. And people, depending on, on how they read this, will go out and buy these medications. Right. Now, there are two things I want to pick up both that you have mentioned, uh, which is homeopathic drugs. Uh, Professor Athel Johnston also mentioned herbal medication. But before that, I want to talk about the antibiotics and something that we hear a lot, which is called antibiotic resistance. How is that developing? And does it develop very early on when children are given too many antibiotics? Antibiotic resistance uh, is a phenomenon which is growing all over the world. And unfortunately, the drug companies uh, have not been 
developing new antibiotics because of the costs uh, and also the fact that uh, over time that they lose the patents and they become generics. The, the, the real issue in antibiotic resistance, and I'm sure my colleague might confirm this, is that the widespread use of antibiotics in agriculture is where you're seeing the results of all this uh, resistance taking part. And uh, by and large, we were able to, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s to keep up with this, uh, with the changes in, in uh, resistance. But we're running out of drugs now. And we're having multi-resistant uh, organisms which are not responding to anything. Right. Professor Ethel Johnston, a part of this, uh, Dr. Jack Singer explained to us, but a part of the antibiotic resistance that we're seeing, do you believe it is attributed to many individuals consuming uh, this, uh, taking antibiotics over the counter, taking it and consuming it in excessive amounts? I think uh, um, Dr. Singer is correct in saying there is a problem with giving it to animals, but there is also a problem with human beings being able to go to the pharmacy and get a, an antibiotic prescription. And of course, they just take a few of these rather than a complete course. And if they have got a bacterial infection, uh, it, it perhaps is ineffective. But the other thing is it does promote antibiotic resistance because it doesn't give enough antibiotics to kill the, the bacteria. And uh, it, it generates bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics uh, and gives us more chance of that happening. And developing an antibiotic is not a simple process. Uh, and that's why drug companies are having so much difficulty um, and why some of the more recent antibiotics are very expensive because that they, they cost a lot to develop them. Right. Now, when we're talking about uh, self-medication, another narrative which goes around, especially in this part of the world, is going to a doctor will lead to a greater list of medicines being prescribed. And for that very reasons, people avoid doing that. There seems to be a growing distrust of the organized medical community, of big pharma companies, how they sponsor doctors. Take us through this information and break it down for us. How much of um, misinformation is involved in this? It's fairly true to say that if you go to a doctor, you're likely to get prescribed something. That's not necessarily the doctor's fault. That's partly patient expectation. Um, patients go and consult a doctor, and if they get told, well, go away, you'll get better, um, that they don't feel particularly satisfied. They want to be given something that will help them they want to be given a, 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 a medication of some sort, and that way they feel that they've, um, when they've gone to a doctor, they've done something for themselves. But of course, that's not necessarily good if you if you've made or not made. If you've um, if the doctor has given you an antibiotic prescription because you've asked for one, it's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, it should only be when you actually need an antibiotic, you're given one. But occasionally, patients insist on getting getting drugs, and they get given them. It's not the fault of pharma companies or, or doctors. It's the fault of patients expecting uh, a drug that will deal with something when most of the time diseases are self-limiting. Right, Dr. Jack Singer, along those lines, when we talk about uh, the anti-vaxxers gaining momentum and there being uh, more and more uh, myths circulating regarding in, uh, uh, immunization, but also talking about taking medication. You as a doctor, have you felt like there is greater resistance from parents to give their children medication? Not really. I, I think uh, it depends on the, on the doctor-patient relationship, really, and, and whether the, the, the uh, parents uh, believe the doctor and, uh, and what their expectations are when they go and have a consultation. Uh, as my colleague said, uh, a lot of times we see patients coming to see us, especially from abroad, not this country, when they bring uh, various uh, drugs that their child has been given, and it looks like a complete pharmacy. And uh, when you question them about this, it turns out that they've probably seen multiple doctors, and if they don't get the answer they want from one doctor, they get partial drug prescriptions from that person, and they go on to the next doctor until their expectations are satisfied. And that's what we're seeing, this polypharmacy type of approach that the patients want. Because in a way, if you, you don't see a doctor unless you feel that there's something wrong. Now, if you go and see the doctor and he says, 
well, your child doesn't need a, an antibiotic in a way that doesn't reach or satisfy your expectations. And so you'll possibly go to see someone else who says, yes, that's all right, we'll give you an antibiotic. Or you go across in certain countries, many of them, in fact, you can decide yourself, my child needs an antibiotic, no matter what the doctor said, and I'll go and buy one across the, pharmac uh, across the counter at the pharmacy. Right, now in all instances we've stated here, it does seem like there is, of course, a more criticism to be had about self-medication than there are any merits to the argument. But are there benefits for self-medication? I find it very difficult uh, to find any benefits uh, from that type of approach, simply because uh, uh, in the initial uh, uh, contact that we have with patients, they often, as I would say, decide which organ is wrong and, or, or needs to be looked into. And it, oftentimes it turns out to be the opposite of what they, the patient actually thinks is, is the uh, area that, that's uh, the problem. Right. Professor Athol Johnson, do you agree that, that there seems to be very little uh, when, we can sit, when we talk about the benefits of self-medication? The benefits of self-medication come when you've got uh, um, a minor disease, for example, a headache, you take a couple of aspirin, uh, that, that is uh, a, a good rather than, than going and finding a doctor to do something. That's sensible. But if you've got a chronic disease, uh, or, or a serious disease like a serious infection, then you do need to go and see a doctor. And self-medication is not the way forward. Um, self-medication is for minor conditions. Dr. Uh, Jack Singer, now, when we're closing off our conversation here, just one last question to you. As Professor Athol Johnson stated here that self-medication should be all right in cases of minor things such as a headache, et cetera, et cetera. But when we talk about minor symptoms, often they are an indication of a greater underlying health problem. When should an individual take control and go to a doctor, seek out uh, professional medical health, uh, help for something that they considered was a minor problem? That's a difficult question. As a rule of thumb, uh, when we are speaking to patients over the phone and they say, uh, should I come and bring the child to see you? Uh, it really boils down to the parents who are the world's best expert for their child. If they feel there's something wrong with their child, then they should seek medical advice. I mean, if it's a little cut or a bruise or a scratch or, as my colleague was saying, no, I mean, common sense tells you you don't need to see a doctor for that. But, you know, the parents are, at least in pediatrics, are the best judge of whether or not their child is ill. Right. So it's important for parents to remain aware and keenly observe their child, especially when they see a pattern emerging, and that's when they should reach out for help. Thank you so much, Dr. Jack Singer, for joining us from London. Professor Athol Johnston for also joining us from London. We're going to go for a short break. When we come back, we're going to have another story for you. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now, does homeschooling provide an opportunity to give a student the focused and, cu and customized learning experience that experts argue is lacking in educational institutions? Or is the learning outcome often weaker when children are homeschooled? Let's dig deeper into these questions on today's show. Joining us for the conversation is Ms. Homa Arslan, who is an educationist with an experience of over 12 years in the industry. She joins us from Lahore. Also joining us today is Professor Samina Yasmin, who's a teacher and researcher at the University of Western Australia School of Social Sciences and the director and founder of the university's Center for Muslim States and Societies. She joins us from Perth. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. I'd like to jump right into the conversation and Professor Samina Yasmin, I'd like to begin with a point that has been reiterated by many experts around the world, which is that we're seeing a learning crisis unfold in front of our eyes. This predates, of course, the pandemic that we're seeing right now. Do you think that this is largely because educational institutions failed to deal with the problems existing in their structures? It depends on the place you're talking about and the kind of institutions that you're talking about. Because if they're really high quality schools or universities, but especially schools, uh, then uh, the schools do take on the responsibility. But then because 
education has been privatized. My understanding is that a lot of schools basically start focusing on getting money rather than focusing on children. And if we go into economically different classes, then those are who are in the low socioeconomic uh, groups, they tend to suffer more in that case. So the crisis that you're talking about really is situation dependent and the kind of the institution dependent. And of course, then there's a question of the countries where the education is being provided or not being provided. Omar, now let's talk about our sphere of the world and let's talk about uh, Pakistan and South Asia in general. When we see private institutions, uh, many of which you have also had great experience with, when we talk about the profit motive there, perhaps trumping uh, the need to impart customized education of help to help students who are weaker in order to bridge those gaps, do you think that schools are failing in doing that? Actually, um, the first thing I would like to say here is that, you know, um, what Ms. Um, Samina said is perfectly correct. It, there's no tailor cut thing for one institution. Uh, we just have to, you know, um, design it for the kind of social, um, social and economic background we are dealing with. And of course, our private institutions are dealing with things totally different. And what I fail um, to understand um, is the fact that um, not on the part of institutions, but on the part of government, that there was no clear directive other than the fact that 90% of our schools throughout the world were closed. And of course, it was an unprecedented situation where you didn't have um, a rule book. You just have to develop things as you go along. Yes, there are schools which have been having online classes regularly, and but there are schools uh, which fail to provide support which was needed. And uh, to add to that, I wouldn't say that it was entirely um, their fault. Maybe they didn't know that how things would unfold. And maybe they just couldn't forecast that, you know, how this um, dilemma would uh, affect the uh, you know, lives of so many students. So in Pakistan, uh, you just have this really wide gap of equity between private schools and government schools. So private schools, I think, uh, to some extent, they were trying to provide support to a lot of, uh, lot of their student body. And of course, to their teachers as well. So that's right. what I would say. Right, Omar, wait, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I'm sorry to interrupt here. We're going to talk more about what homeschooling uh, will look like later on in the year when schools uh, don't choose to open up and have online classes. Is it better for parents to just pull them out? We're going to have that discussion. But I want to pick up on this learning crisis that we're talking about, which, of course, also uh, includes private schools and talks about learning outcomes not being as they should be, especially when we talk about critical thinking. What do you think is the main reason for that? It's the lack of structure. When, when you're dealing face to face, uh, you have decided the schedule, you have decided that this much, and there's like a whole chain that it's not only the teacher, um, who's uh, included in the whole learning outcome thing. You have the coordinators, you have the management, and then you share your learning outcomes. That this is like the way lesson plans are made, the way uh, students are supported throughout the academic year. So I think this is where we failed to see that, um, I've seen many schools who have just um, given a lot of online homework while there was no uh, support given from the teachers. But on the other hand, there are certain schools who have just done a lot of online teaching as, as much as up to six hours. And uh, yes, sometimes it stretches even after the working hours of school. So um, what I see that if you're moving into the post COVID world, we need to decide that is it going to be a blend of face-to-face -face teaching? And uh, is it going to be only the e-learning or how are we going to do that? So this is something which, which is questionable, and I think it cannot just be decided uh, in exclusion. Like, you have to uh, sit together with the entire team. You need to uh, right. decide that this is the learning outcome we need, and, uh, and there has to be a lot of planning that needs to go into it. 
Right, of course, as the situation is curious and as schools try to figure out how to move forward uh, during this pandemic, um, it's very important to keep in mind all the factors that contribute to a good learning experience. But the conversation I do want to have right now is something that has existed as a problem prior to the pandemic, prior to distance learning, prior to when uh, classrooms had to shift online. This was a consistent problem that was observed. Um, Professor Samina Yasmin, related to what we're discussing right now is the idea of critical thinking and one that we're hearing a lot in discussions and debates that is decreasing within students. Do you see that as well in, as a teacher and as a professor who deals with so many students? I would again say it depends on the area that you're talking about and the countries you're talking about. I think in a country like Australia where I teach, students are expected to have critical thinking. Uh, not definitely based upon where they come from and to what extent they have been taught well or not by their own teachers. You do have different levels of critical thinking, but overall there is a willingness in the system to permit the students to question anything and everything and also learn the art of rational thinking and, as you said, critical thinking. Uh, I'm not saying that Australia is the best, but I think at least there is a greater possibility in the society and therefore in the schools to have that uh, capacity for critical thinking. Right, those are very important points and thank you so much Professor Samina Yasmin for taking out the time and joining us from Perth. Uh, Oma, now as we've been talking about uh, homeschooling, something, uh, a concept, an idea that existed prior to this distance learning that schools were for forced to do during the pandemic, why do you think it is uh, on the rise in many parts of the world, parents taking it upon themselves to teach their children as opposed to putting them in educational institutions. Um, Michelle, I would just like to add some uh, something to what Ms. Samina already said. Yes, critical thinking, uh, something which is very important, but um, like as you compare our schooling, the modern schooling, I'm. I'm, I personally consider myself um, an IB teacher, so um, not every school in, um, in our country is an IB school, but trust me, over the past 10 years, uh, this approach of having a fixed uh, uh, learning routine or having this uh, road learning thing, it has changed. And I've seen it changing, you know, we were educated here, I had my earlier education in Karachi, uh, that too in a convent. So when, when you reflect on that time and when you sit and uh, plan how to engage your students these days, it's different. And I think it would be a little unfair to say that we don't encourage it, we encourage it. Uh, what I believe where we lack and where we differ from the rest of the world is the proper teacher training. So many institutions believe in you know, investing in teacher training and where they get to know about different learning approaches. Right. So, for I take your point there. I take your point there. It's a welcome change that we're seeing uh, being more engagement with critical thinking and less uh, emphasis on rote learning. But going back to that initial point, and I think it's important to talk about what do you think uh, parents find, and as a teacher, uh, what do you think are the reasons why parents would think homeschooling is an appealing option? I, I would love to hear your take on that. So I, you know, personally, uh, if you're asking me to take a side about traditional schooling and homeschooling, I wouldn't vouch for homeschooling ever. I would say yes, reinforcement or maybe uh, personalized um, interaction with parents, it's important. Uh, but you know, uh, even homeschooling is not an option when it comes to Pakistan, where you have over 75% of population which is not even educated. So how do we expect? So again, uh, sub, there is a group of people, or you can say there is a class of uh, parents who are educated, who are aware, who can even handle lessons, but not everybody can do that. For now, I see um, if parents are preferring homeschooling because maybe because it's the economic restraint. And uh, then again, you know, once this whole thing is over, once we are out of the COVID world, they would have to go back to their nine to five jobs. A lot of parents are working these days. So how would they get that support? 
And um, so I don't think that homeschooling could be an option in long run. But when we come to talk about countries like Australia and some parts of Latin America, distant learning was always a thing because uh, their population structure, their demographics are different. So um, in Pakistan or in, in the third world countries or even in Britain, uh, homeschooling is not always an option. Uh, and secondly, firstly, because not everybody is trained that way. Parents don't have um, the source resources. And they're not even, uh, you know, uh, sometimes they're just too occupied with their own um, employments. So, um, yes, uh, we need to develop a structure. We need to figure out an approach where we can support parents. But I think pulling students out of that, uh, the traditional schooling system shouldn't really be an option because uh, schools are not only for learning, therefore, you know, you're developing your interpersonal skills, therefore right. your social emotional uh, growth and everything. So you can't raise a child in seclusion. Right. So yes, there's a lot of concern, which is developing about their health and all, but, um, but what, uh, what I can say, uh, even as a parent, I would like my son to go back to his university once this whole thing is over. So I wouldn't really want him to sit in front of a computer and get lectures. Right. I would like him to be outside, interact with people, and learn as they go along. Uh, Homa, those are all very important points that you mentioned here, and I'm going to come back to you and talk to you a little about the content and engagement within the classrooms, how that can be improved in many instances. But before that, I'd also like to introduce Dr. Nina Markovic, who's a mother of a daughter and who she is ha uh, homeschooling for the past six months now. She joins us from Sydney. Thank you so much, Dr. Markovic, for joining us. Hope you're doing well. Now, when we're talking about your experience as a mother having to do this, especially under uh, such uh, stressful circumstances, how has the experience been? And is it something you would want to invest in long term? It was certainly eye-opening. I'm actually a university lecturer, but I must say it was much harder homeschooling a five-year-old than 21-year-olds, uh, even if there are 50 of them. Um, on one level, homeschooling offers students um, and parents a lot of flexibility. In Australia, like the previous um, um, expert mentioned correctly, uh, there is distance learning um, for some many decades now. Possibly it was initially out of philosophical reasons, but now it's also for religious reasons and for special needs students. Um, this year, everyone is in a difficult situation with COVID-19 pandemic in Australia. Parents overnight became home educators, uh, mostly women, um, but also some men as well. Uh, many people lost jobs. Um, and this was a new profession and a new challenge for all of us. On one level, as a parent, you get involved more intimately with the material that your child is dealing with. And many of us didn't realize how much they are dealing with on a daily basis. Um, we would all say teachers need higher salaries, they need a pay rise. Um, on the other level, some of us felt we're not really qualified to um, teach all that's required. Um, often you have other children involved um, who are disrupting the learning cycle of the child that you're trying to devote your attention to. But home learning doesn't have to be done in isolation. There are different methods and styles um, of conducting home learning. There are actually different families getting together online in this current situation, but before COVID-19 pandemic in person and actually exchanging experiences. And there are many different platforms in Australia in which these parents are gaining insights and use different resources which are available. I think in the third world, uh, possibly including in Pakistan, it's definitely possible to have a successful home learning strategy, but the government, like in Australia, needs to have a system. In Australia, if you want to be a home educator, you actually have to apply um, and your child needs to be registered. So it's not automatic. There are about 20 to 30,000 uh, families who are involved in this process, but some are actually unregistered. So to be sort of recognized, you need to be registered. And um, there are different methods and styles, as I mentioned. There is a Steiner method, Montessori method, uh, Mason method. So there are many different methods. I have actually friends who have chosen specifically to homeschool because of religious 
reasons. They wanted to provide children with Christian education and they felt that the secular public system does not allow that and they chose not to send to private schools either. So there are many different reasons, right. but certainly it's not an easy task. Definitely, it doesn't seem like an easy task, quite overwhelming. Uh, Homana, when we're talking about how to move forward, especially for the coming term, and a question that many uh, parents from affluent families, from uh, very educated families who have their children in schools, but might have to, uh, these schools might have to resort to online learning because of the circumstances, they question whether it's still worth having their children enrolled in schools. What would your opinion and take be on that? Actually, you're right. There is um, a concern, and which I believe is rightly so, because everyone is under emotional and economic strain. But um, to be very honest, um, it would resolve with time, right? Uh, yes, um, what I have seen, the general trend I've seen, um, is that they want support from the school, and they want this reassurance that um, once your child joins back school, you would be safe. So um, how I personally see it is whenever we decide to open our schools, it has to be followed up with strict SOPs. It has to be structured in a way that we guarantee well-being of our students and, and of course, teachers as well. So um, yes, in many parts of the world, uh, schools are opening. Um, since I deal at the moment, I have been a primary teacher, I've been doing a PYP, then I've been doing a project-based learning where we used to follow uh, Maria Montessori and Rigio Emilia approaches. But these days I'm dealing with uh, A-level students. They want to get back to classrooms. Uh, yes, you're right, some of them enjoy uh, being at home, but most of them are missing that um, that environment that school provides. And uh, so uh, what I believe, we have to find this approach, which has to be midway, where uh, we can decide uh, certain schools would not be um, able to function at full strength. Maybe for starters, we can just have the middle and the senior years coming in. So I think this is something which needs to be devised. And it has to take um, uh, the safety of all students in um, in focus. Um, Oma, instance, I'm sorry to interject um, here. I'm sorry to interject here. But one question that I do want to ask is the idea of equity and also the idea of helping students who might have fallen back a little during this time. When you have classrooms with such a, a, a high strength, so many students there, it's often difficult to give individual attention to each and every one. But how are private schools, which do have the resources, do have the funds, how are they planning uh, to keep this in mind that many children who will return might have gaps because of whatever has happened during this pandemic? Actually, um, many schools now have co-teaching. There's not always one, one teacher in the class. So there is a student and teacher ratio, which is always kept in mind in most schools. And I've personally seen it. In certain schools, it's, uh, it's a little overwhelming, but most private schools in Pakistan, you have co-teaching. So we divide, and of course, um, we kind of provide extra support when um, we don't have the same planning for all the students after observing them for a few sessions, we devise a, a kind of a different planner for them and we engage them on their level. So if they need extra support, we are always there. There is always a supporting staff and uh, there is always room to give them extra lessons. And there's always, uh, we, we do supplement uh, their work, we kind of provide extra support. So it's, which is, this is something which is already being done. And I believe it would be, it would have to be done uh, even uh, to a greater extent once we right. decide to open the schools. Right on that point, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Omar Islan, for joining us from Lahore. Uh, Dr. Markovic, going back to you and talking about a, a little more about the situation as it unfolds in Sydney, we saw cases, uh, we saw the situation quite under control, but as cases rise again, the situation becomes more precarious. As a parent, what are your concerns for the coming school year? 
Um, many experts are actually saying that this year should be about acquiring other skills, not just academic skills. But that is difficult for parents like myself who have a kindy um, age student, which in Australia, in New South Wales in particular, means they need to learn to read and write within this year. So what I did as a parent is I enrolled into extra educational resources online, um, I don't want to promote them, but the ones I found useful and also engage some private tutoring on top of my sort of methods of delivering lessons. Um, that is sort of extra, extra support, but I don't think it's enough. And maybe it is about rethinking the whole education system. I mean, um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of special needs students in Australia, especially autism students, are already being homeschooled. I think this year is going to put homeschooling into a spotlight and more families will definitely choose to homeschool their children, especially this year, because for private schools, fees are still expensive, parents still have to pay and children um, are uncertain. Uh, many schools have, in Victoria, everything is online, Melbourne. Um, it's, they, have, they can't go even outside the children without masks. So it's a much more difficult situation. Sydney schools close down if there is a suspected case or confirmed case, um, but it does give a feeling of anxiousness. So this is why many parents choose to homeschool, to have some sense of control over what the child is receiving. Right. Um, uh, Markovic, stay with me. Uh, we're also joined by Ms. Vita Menyang, who joins us from Jakarta. She's a mother of three daughters. Uh, Vita, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the show. Now, we've been talking about the experience of parents and teachers during this time and whether homeschooling permanently is coming up as an option for many individuals. Where do you stand uh, in this debate, in this conversation? Um, I think uh, homeschooling permanently is probably not uh, I would I would go for uh, probably a more hybrid situation. Uh, so, you know, there has to be some kind of socialization between uh, the kids with the same age and, you know, like younger and older children around them. So um, most of the days I would prefer that uh, they stay home. But I think um, if the school does it properly, you know, uh, with with the proper hygiene and health uh, procedure and also, you know, making the classroom smaller, uh, rotating it so that the kids can go to school like once a week or twice a week at least. Uh, I think that that that's uh, the way to go for me, you know, so a hybrid kind of uh, homeschooling. Right. Vita, now you're uh, of three daughters. How difficult has it been for you uh, to engage your uh, daughters in online learning during this time? It's funny because with the three children, I find that um, they they work very differently. Uh, my My first one, she's 17 now, so it was grade 11 when we started homeschool. Uh, she did very, very well. Uh, I guess with the amount of work that they're getting in the uh, IB program, uh, she, because she's old enough, she can manage her uh, time more uh, appropriately. So she has the flexibility to work within her um, uh, time frame uh, that is not you know, uh, very rigid, you know, from school. But with the younger ones, I think they still struggle because it's too flexible. Uh, they still need a lot of structure and format. So if, if uh, you don't watch them closely, they tend to just, you know, get away and watching Netflix more than studying and all those things that they still can't control, uh, you know, what's good for them so that they don't have to always catching up, you know? Right. So stay on the course, it's, it's harder when you're younger. Right, of course, uh, with younger kids, I'm sure mm, an uphill battle getting them uh, to structure their day, structure their routine and move towards, you know, learning and absorbing what's happening online. Dr. Nina Markovic, just one last question from you. Now, when you mentioned earlier about the focus being away from, um, just academia and more on learning other skills. You having a daughter, do you think at this point in time that is also something you would be looking into, helping your child develop other skills, opportunities, uh, perhaps that weren't given by the school? 
Definitely, it kind of um, this situation prompts every parent to think outside the box. So that is a positive outcome of the current uh, entrapment that many of us um, are faced with this year and possibly next year. What is interesting, there are a lot of um, initiatives which have involved online amongst friends. So you have a cooking class for children amongst your peer group um, and then dancing class. Um, not everything has to be paid. But one thing I think with kids need to always remember is to use their hands and their body, um, not just technology. So that balance between the physical aspect of education and mental aspect as well as emotional is something that is always going to be challenge, challenging at home and at school. So it is a good blend um, to think about um, all these issues out outside the box. Right. Vida, on that center, y you wanting your children uh, to have that socialization opportunity, but that not being possible during this time. How do you think uh, parents such as yourself can help children move away from just being glued to technology and uh, develop other skills? I completely agree with uh, uh, Dr. Nina. I think you have to see what their interest is more than anything. But uh, certain things is uh, a must. Uh, like for me, my I told my to be outdoor for an hour a day. You know, you have to get the sun exposure because you know um, that is the whole point of lockdown to to stay healthy. And if they don't have that, then you know what's the point, right? Um, to to just isolate yourself. So for me. Um, socializing uh if before they get to socialize with anyone anywhere right uh, now they can socialize with uh people you actually trust people with the same kind of uh family dynamic with the same kind of um uh, goal you know uh, so it's a smaller uh, group of people but mm -hmm. i think socializing um still you know it's still there you know they still learn how to share how to manage friendship how to you know uh, grow together you know with friends i think that's very important so that they, you don't feel alone in this world i think uh to have that uh, people around you who with, with the same interests i think would be would be a good support for their learning curve right on that point, thank you so much, Dr. Nina Markovic, for joining us from Sydney, Ms. Vita Menyang for joining us from Jakarta. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today. We will see you again next time with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.